Hello, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the role of factor 10A anticoagulation in the treatment of both venous and arterial diseases. Uh, this is an educational uh, uh, CME event and sponsored by an educational grant from Janssen Scientific. Um, it's a pleasure to have this esteemed panel here with us today to really discuss um, really the role of how to prevent thrombosis in both the venous and arterial tree. Here are our learning objectives. So with that, I'd like to really kick off the program. The program is structured in a way where you're going to have uh, four talks really uh, looking at uh, thrombosis in both venous and arterial trees. And then we have a series of clinical scenarios and discussing them and how we would manage them. So I think we'll get a lot out of this session. So uh, without uh, much more delay, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Camarota to this stage. He's going to discuss the significance of arterial and venous thrombosis. Avoidance is the best strategy. Dr. Camarota, welcome to me. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Tina. It's a real uh, privilege to be here with this esteemed faculty. And my job is to address arterial and venous thrombosis in eight minutes. These are my disclosures. So there are some major implications for uh, this particular topic, and they include deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, MI, stroke, cardiovascular death, and major limb events, because all of these are the consequences of acute thrombosis. But really, as we focus down on the topic, uh, the real questions are, can anticoagulation with 10A inhibition reduce the onset and the recurrence of acute venous thromboembolism? And can they reduce thrombotic complications of arterial disease? Those are the real questions. And time doesn't permit me to lay the details of the foundation for primary prevention of venous thromboembolism, but suffice it to say that, that quite a few randomized trials have demonstrated the effectiveness and safety of 10A inhibition on the prevention of post-op venous thromboembolism in patients undergoing total hip and total knee replacement. Hard level one data. So yes, 10A inhibition can prevent, do primary prevention. But then there have been secondary prevention trials for venous thromboembolism that proved 10A inhibition was effective and safe that led the ACCP to recommend the direct oral anticoagulants in preference to vitamin K antagonists for the treatment of acute venous thromboembolism that was not related to cancer. And here are the, the direct oral anticoagulants. And you can see that the trials that were conducted for uh, secondary prevention were all non-inferiority trials. That is, can they do as well as vitamin K antagonists and low molecular weight heparin? And each of them did. They met the criteria for non-inferiority, but point estimates for most of the trials demonstrated that the DOACs were even better. And there was superiority demonstrated for pulmonary embolism with rivaroxaban and, and deep venous thrombosis and PE with the pixaban in terms of reduction in major bleeding. And then Paolo Prandoni and his colleagues addressed the very important question of recurrent venous thromboembolism after discontinuing anticoagulation. How big a problem is this? Well, it's an enormous problem. When you look at unprovoked venous thromboembolism, there was a 40% recurrence at five years and over 50% recurrence at 10 years. And these recurrences are not related to thrombophilias. PE generally presents as, a recurrent PE presents as PE recurrent DVT. Obviously, the initial event was DVT most of the time, and medical provocation has a much higher risk of recurrence than surgical provocation. And if the recurrence of DVT is in the ipsilateral limb, there is an incredible increase in the severity of post-thrombotic syndrome. But what about death? The Riete investigators in a, in a, in a database of over 41,000 patients demonstrated that for recurrent pulmonary embolism, 
case fatality was over 18% for recurrent PE. Recurrent DVT, 6.3%. And the problem is the major bleeding complications for recurrences are very high, almost 20%. So there's a major problem. Now, the Einstein Choice trial took this question of recurrence and studied extended anticoagulation, that is beyond six to 12 months for prevention of recurrence at a much lower dose of a 10A inhibitor, rivaroxaban. And they looked at rivaroxaban uh, 20 milligrams per day, 10 milligrams per day versus aspirin and demonstrated a significant 73% reduction in recurrence with no increased risk of major bleeding. An enormous step in the right direction to handle secondary prevention for recurrent DVT with extended or indefinite anticoagulation. So the risk of recurrent VTE was significantly lower with rivaroxaban 10 milligrams compared to low-dose aspirin. As you can see, a 73% risk reduction without any increased risk of major bleeding. So we know 10A inhibition is effective and safe for primary and secondary prevention of venous thromboembolism. So if we transition to the arterial side of the circulation, is there a role for 10A inhibition for prevention of thrombosis? in patients with peripheral arterial disease. And this was addressed by the COMPASS trial and the COMPASS investigators that looked at 27,000 patients with coronary carotid or peripheral arterial disease, randomized them to very low-dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day plus aspirin versus 5 milligrams of rivaroxaban twice a day versus aspirin alone. The results from the overall trial demonstrated a 24% risk reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. However, there was an increased risk of major bleeding. But really, the group that we're interested in is patients with peripheral arterial disease. And this group of 7,400 patients was addressed by Sonia Anand and her colleagues looking at these three different doses of pharmacologic agents, randomized one to one to one and demonstrated a 28% risk reduction of major adverse cardiovascular events when patients received 2.5 milligrams of rivaroxaban twice a day with 100 milligrams of aspirin. But most importantly, and this impressed me, not only was there a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events, but a reduction in major adverse limb events. To my knowledge, this is the first major study that showed both. Both. So the conclusion was that yes, 10A inhibition with rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams BID and aspirin, reduced MACE and male. Major bleeding was increased, but not fatal or critical organ bleeding. And it was effective for primary prevention of PAD. But then Sonia Anand wanted to know what happened to patients who had a major adverse limb event, a major adverse limb thrombosis. And that is specifically in patients with male. So she looked at male versus no male, and what was the impact of low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared to aspirin alone? And you can see that in patients who suffered a major adverse limb event, their risk of recurrent hospitalization within 12 months was 61%. 20% risk of amputation and an increased risk of all-cause mortality by 200%. If those patients received low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin, there is a 43% risk reduction in major adverse limb events, a 58% risk reduction in major amputation, and a 24% risk reduction in vascular intervention and all-cause complications. So, I'm going to end up here because I've got to the overview of both venous and arterial, primary and secondary prevention, and I know the following speakers will address these in a bit more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kermode. That's a fantastic uh, overview. We'll have uh, Dr. Kalori join us. He will discuss the mechanism of action and uh, guidelines for DOAX and 10A inhibitors. Thank you. Thanks for the invite, you know. Um, 
There will be some overlap in content uh, with Dr. Kamarota, uh, but I think it's for the good. Um, not much to disclose. Um, so in terms of mechanisms, um, don't want to bore you with the uh, clotting cascade here, but uh, just uh, in the color-coded uh, 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 image here, the red, the unfractionated heparin, uh, works on mostly the extrinsic pathway um, and uh, warfarin, the older, uh, the, the, these older drugs um, uh, is going to what start about uh, start with. Warfarin, on the other hand, works mostly on the intrinsic pathway, the 210, 9, and one of the uh, extrinsic pathways, the 7. Um, now, when, when you look at the common pathway where the prothrombin uh, converts to thrombin, that is mediated by factor 10A. Now, the older drug anti, uh, th that was specific to factor 10 inhibition was fondaparinux, but we have the apexaban, betrexaban, edoxaban, or rivaroxaban in, the, in just the alphabetic order. And then there are direct thrombin inhibitors, uh, previously the argatroban, bivalerudin, liperidin, but the new drug, um, no longer really new, is uh, uh, dabigatran. So when you look at these pharmaco when you look at the pharmacokinetics, most of these have around the same half-life except for the betrexaban, which is 20 hours, which is long, and most are um, eliminated uh, um, hepatically except for uh, uh, the dabigatran, which uh, is mostly renal, so we have to be very cautious in patients with renal insufficiency. Most of these are uh, once a day dose, except for apixaban, which is twice a day. No monitoring is needed. Um, cytochrome uh, um, uh, 3A4 uh, interactions are seen with most of these drugs. Um, and uh, there is uh, no reports of uh, type 2 heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with any of these drugs. So in terms of the guidelines, we're going to talk um, mostly uh, about these three guidelines. One is the European uh, Society for Cardiology Pulmonary Embolism uh, Guidelines, uh, the CHEST guidelines that Dr. Kamarota referred to, and then the ASH guidelines, the American Society for Hematology. The only issue with the, uh, uh, the ASH guidelines is that they presume that you've already made a decision of what anticoagulant you use, and then they talk about the practical aspects of what needs to be done, so not very much we can cover in that there. So in terms of the guidelines for treatment, you all know that the first, anti, uh, first episode of uh, uh, DVT, proximal DVT, or a pulmonary embolism, is uh, three months of anticoagulation uh, with either warfarin, uh, low molecular weight, heparin in cancer, or a DOAC. And then after that, you sort of risk stratify. If you have a second unprovoked DVT, it's a long-term uh, um, um, uh, treatment for anticoagulation that's recommended at a 1B by the CHEST guidelines. Uh, if they have moderate to high bleeding, uh, you have to be very careful. They do s suggest long-term bleeding even in moderate risk patients, but uh, you have to have patient input in there and shared decision making. And in patients with cancer, you have to treat them until the cancer is deemed cured. Um, so along with um, uh, vitamin K antagonist warfarin, uh, all the DOACs do receive grade 2B recommendations. So none of them is grade 1A because there are no randomized controlled trials head-to-head -head, uh, even with warfarin. Um, similar guidelines uh, for the pulmonary embolism. Uh, this is probably the most recent uh, uh, guidelines we have from uh, the European Heart uh, Association. And uh, again, the anticoagulation, this time they give uh, this change from 2016 chest guidelines to the ESC guidelines as oral anticoagulation with a DOAC is 1A recommendation, and the DOACs are not recommended in severe renal impairment uh, pregnancy, lactation, and patients with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So hope you got that pretest question right. Um, duration of anticoagulation, what do you do? So here is um, one scheme. Uh, this was uh, uh, also published uh, by Jeff Barnes in Vascular Medicine. So if you have the first DVT and it's situational, you basically treat it only with three months of anticoagulation, not six months, not one year, There's, it's just three months. Um, if you have malignancy, like I said, you have to stop, uh, you, you have to uh, start with low molecular weight heparin and continue the anticoagulation until the cancer is deemed cured. If the patient 
refuses low molecular weight heparin, it's DOAC over uh, warfarin. We'll talk about why that is the case. If it's unprovoked, you actually have to sit down and talk to the patient. These consoles typically take uh, about 40, 45 minutes because it's a, it's, there's a lot to talk. If the patient doesn't want anticoagulation after you have discussed with the patient, yes, no anticoagulation, but if the patient is not sure, you might want to get a D-dimer while he's on anticoagulation or she's on anticoagulation, and if it is positive, go for long-term anticoagulation. If it is negative, then one month after stopping anticoagulation, you repeat the DOAC, I'm sorry, D-dimer, and if it is positive, then you go on for long-term anticoagulation. If you have two negatives, then you basically stop the anticoagulation. Now, there are risk assessment models, the DASH score, the Vienna score, the HERDU2 scores, uh, that uh, you can find on calculators, MedCalc, and uh, all those uh, calculators, and you can plug in numbers and look at the risk. Um, but as Dr. Kamarota said, for the secondary prevention, there are two trials that uh, uh, changed most of our practice uh, for people who manage uh, anticoagulation and venous, venous thromboembolic disease. So the v I, uh, Einstein choice that uh, um, was a non-inferiority study compared to aspirin, as Dr. Camarota said, looked at the bleeding risk, and the bleeding risk was, you know, same as aspirin, 100 milligrams, or you know, we extrapolate that to 81 milligrams in the United States. And then when you look at the Amplify Extend, again, significant reduction in recurrence. But now this was bleeding was similar to placebo, so low dose. Apexaban was similar to placebo. How much better can that get, right, in terms of bleeding? So I have that discussion with the patients about the DASH scores and also talk to them about these two trials and say that you, and then you have the Warfasa and Aspire trial, which I did not have the time to put in uh, in, the, in the given time, which reduced the relative risk reduction with aspirin was 6.6. Um, so these decrease it further down to about 2% or general population risk. So since those two trials, more, more than uh, people who are not on anticoagulation, more people are on anticoagulation, at least in my practice. The long-term treatment uh, recommendations, both from CHEST and uh, from the ESC guidelines, uh, recommend use of low-dose uh, rivaroxaban or apixaban after the first three to six months but uh, edoxaban and rivaroxaban is also uh, okay to use in PE with cancer. Um, it is also a good practice to see these patients, if not yourself, at least your extended, uh, um, uh, uh, your uh, physician extender, uh, advanced practice provider, six to 12 months if the patients have renal insufficiency. If the renal insufficiency uh, with a creatinine clearance is less than 50 ml every three months, but I generally don't use DOAX in this uh, population at all. What about cancer and VT? There are three different trials quickly. Select D uh, is one uh, that looked at uh, rivaroxaban. Then there is Adam VTE, which primary endpoint was major bleeding and safety compared to Delta Perrin and Hercosi. All are non-inferiority studies. And all three basically showed um, non-inferiority compared to low molecular weight heparin. So based on that, the long-term treatment in cancer patients uh, is, again, edoxaban and rivaroxaban have made it a 2A recommendation in the ESC guidelines. And um, the uh, Adam VTE, which was published after this paper was published, uh, will probably make it into those guidelines as well. You, you saw uh, the uh, uh, data on PAD and DOAX. I'm going to skip these two trials you, Dr. Kamarota already talked about. Uh, but you might want to look at myperforalarterydisease.com. This, uh, this is a toolkit from our society, the Society for Vascular Medicine. And to summarize with what Dr. Kamarota said, uh, you want to use it in patients who have polyvascular disease with low bleeding risk or in patients who you want your male reduction, meaning major adverse limb event reduction, and have ble low bleeding risk. Sorry, I went over. Thank you. No, I think that was fantastic. Those are really important points, and I think uh, really we're trying to set the, the stage here and talked about guidelines. We talked a little bit about mechanism of action and overview of the studies. Now we're going to really kind of look at both arterial and venous disease in a little bit more depth. It's a pleasure to welcome Bill Gray, one of the course directors, to discuss the role uh, for arterial, uh, preventing arterial thrombosis. 
Thanks, Tino. Um, well, you've seen a lot of this. There's going to be some repetition, but that's okay. Um, it's not easy stuff. So, uh, not to sprain your brain too early in the morning, but let's talk about this because actually it's a relevant, it's, it is relevant to the larger uh, issue of how to manage arterial disease and anticoagulation. So, you know, the, the progression of arterial disease is really based on uh, plaque rupture. So if you have uncontrolled, uh, if you, you, this is an uncontrolled event. Once plaque ruptures, I'm going to go down the platelet pathway here for a moment. You have exposure of uh, collagen and mononucleotide factors, and then that will uh, then in turn lead to plate adhesion and, and secretion and activation. So you, ha you get this platelet pathway independent of what's going on with the thrombin pathway. On the other on the other hand, you get tissue factor and factor 12A also uh, exposed during plaque rupture, and and once that occurs, you start to uh, activate these uh, uh, proteinase activase receptors, which are basically platelet activators. And the, they go on and activate and recruit platelets, which then feed back. Once this platelet activation and recruitment has begun, it feeds back into a procoagulant surface phenomenon, and you get into thrombin generation. So I think it was back at you know, my medical school days, the, the expression was, nothing begets thrombus more than thrombus. And you can see why, because it becomes a, a cyclical uh, uh, reentry re pathway, which uh, enables itself. I want you to focus on this piece right here, because both platelets and thrombin generation will lead to thrombin ge further thrombin generation, which ultimately leads to the, the platelet fiber and thrombus complex. And it's been known for a while, and it's not, it's not something we talk about a lot in medicine or in cardiovascular medicine, but it's been known for a long time that vitamin K uh, antagonists actually do work to prevent coronary artery disease progression or uh, cardiovascular events. There was a meta-analysis in 2003 that showed the overall thrombotic risk was reduced with an odds ratio statistically significant of about 0.79. But the reason we don't use it is because increased bleeding risk, and a lot of the bleeding with, uh, with warfarin is, uh, it, that we worry about is intracranial <laughs> bleeding. And really, the differentiation in my mind, one of the things that I carry around with me is that uh, DOACs uh, provide very similar, if not better, anticoagulation therapy, uh, therapeutics, but without the intracranial bleeding that warfarin carries. So that's one message that could be important. The other thing is that now there's new drugs and new opportunities with the DOACs. We've already seen what they look like. They're easier to administer. They don't require testing. And the risk-benefit ratio, when you look at, at studies like atrial fibrillation studies, in every case, they were at least as good or better in, thromb in systemic embolization and stroke reduction, but with less intracranial bleeding, as I mentioned before. So last pathway, I promise, but it is important because it tells you where everything works. Um, this, it, we have two mechanisms of DOAC uh, action. Uh, one is through the direct thrombin inhibitor. So remember that circle, we t that, that reentrant piece here, that's, that occurs right here. So you can actually, with uh, the bigotran, you can uh, um, inhibit thrombin. And with the other factor 10A inhibitors, you get into the 10A uh, inhibition, which uh, inhibits the tr transition from prothrombin to thrombin. Again, on the right side of pathway in that first chart. So um, I'm going to talk about DOACs and acute coronary syndrome because that was a foundational p basis for a lot of what we're doing in PAD as well. So there were trials looking at apixaban um, and dabigatran, and while they did seem to, in some cases, uh, show better thrombotic event control, it wasn't striking, uh, but they did show significantly more bleeding. And so these really never saw the light of day for prevention of coronary disease or peripheral arterial disease. But using rivaroxaban, um, first at a little higher dose um, and then at lower dose, you can see that, in fact, uh, there was lower thrombotic event rates, and depending on the dose, uh, higher bleeding with the higher dose of rivaroxaban, but actually very acceptable bleeding risk um, in the lower dose with still preservation of thrombotic risk reduction. So this is a summary table of the ACS trials. If you, if you look at the totality of the ACS trials, and I could split this out, we could talk all day about this, but if you, if you look at the totality of the trials, basically what we learned was that with low-dose regimen for rivaroxaban was effective uh, to minimize the risk of, risk of bleeding but also in, improve thrombotic events. And, and interestingly, we, we noticed that the DOACs were always um, paired with dual antiplatelet therapy. It turns out we probably only need single antiplatelet therapy for effectiveness because the dual antiplatelet therapy adds to the bleeding risk. So uh, Gem this is the last ACS trial. The Gemini ACS looked at single antiplatelet therapy in rivaroxaban, 
and replaced aspirin with, with uh, NOAX. And we tried to then uh, figure out whether or not this, in, in post-intervention, in, post, uh, whether this was going to be a, a reasonable strategy. And it turns out that there wasn't a big difference between the strategies. And it turns out that dual antiplatelet therapy with either Tectagalor or Prazogrel and aspirin was more effective than DAPT with NOAC after ACS. So the interest in NOACs and ACS kind of waned. But along came the COMPASS trial, which you've seen here. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail, because it's really the granddaddy of the trials. Um, 27,000 patients, all with uh, acute coronary disease, sorry, uh, coronary disease, uh, peripheral arterial disease, um, or prior stroke. And you can see that the, this atherosclerotic disease was a kind of enhanced population. Follow-up was, uh, was almost two years. You've seen this chart already. Rivaroxaban plus low-dose aspirin was the most effective in reducing um, thrombo thrombo uh, thrombotic events and uh, uh, cardiovascular events. But I wanted to show this to you a little bit more closely. Let's dive into this. While there was a statistically significant difference in reduction of overall cardiovascular death, the thing that was most striking was that it was a stroke reduction. Stroke reduction was almost half uh, in the river Oxfam plus aspirin group as compared to aspirin alone. And this has been picked up as a, as a major uh, benefit of this strategy. Um, the bleeding endpoints, I talked about this before. There was more bleeding with the rivaroxaban uh, and aspirin uh, versus uh, aspirin alone, but it, it, it was felt to be acceptable. And you can see here, sorry, going back, you can see here no fatal intracranial uh, hemorrhage of statistical significance or no other uh, critical fatal uh, bleeding uh, differential. So while there was increased major bleeding, it was a low rate and found uh, felt to be acceptable as a, a trade off to the, the benefit. And <coughs> This is a, a net clinical benefit chart, which basically uh, summarizes the positives and negatives of any, of any study. And you can see in specific subgroups, patients under the age of 65, patients with a history, of, with no history of cabbage, and patients who have a TIMI risk score which is elevated, those patients tend to do at least as well or better than the overall COMPASS population. Okay, big chart, uh, major messages. So this is, this is a summary chart of the trials that have been done in antiplatelet therapies. And you can see here that with or without uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, and single antiplatelet therapy, and so on, we do get reduction in peripheral arterial disease patients. We do get reductions in events, uh, and as Tony mentioned, and including in uh, major adverse limb events. But unfortunately, it came at the cost of, in, in the most effective trials, it came at the cost of increased bleeding. So this was an equation that none of us were willing to really inflict on our patients. However, now if we look specifically at the same chart, but now we add in the, the rivaroxaban uh, trials, you can see that we have significant, and this is just in the PAD patients, we have significant reduction in overall cardiovascular events and uh, male major, major adverse limb events, as Tony mentioned, but with only a modest increase in major bleeding as compared to the other trials which had less uh, positive effect and more negative effect. So this is kind of where we're, where we're kind of uh, uh, landed uh, in terms of anticoagulation therapy in PAD patients. It also turns out that there's a health eco economic benefit to this. I'm not going to go into this for detail. It's a Markov model, which basically uh, plays out all the scenarios you can imagine and then runs it through a probabilistic mechanism so that you get a series of uh, outcomes. And this is the probabilistic outcome. This was done in England, so it was in pounds. But uh, 30,000 pounds is the, is the kind of uh, threshold, and this is uh, well within the 30,000 pounds quality adjusted life year. So it is cost effective as well as being uh, clinically effective. What's ahead? The Voyager PAD study has finished its enrollment. And we, this is a trial looking specifically at patients who have had prior successful uh, lower extremity revascularization and symptomatic PAD. It's going to be randomized to aspirin plus rivaroxaban or uh, aspirin alone. And um, we're going to look at the primary endpoints as well. Again, I wanted to show you this last uh, study. If you look at all the trials that have been done in the PAD uh, with large CV trials looking at PAD inclusion, you can see that only a couple of them have met their primary endpoints. The Capri trial, which we're familiar with, the TRAP trial, which, which um, uh, use uh, 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 Wuproxen, and the uh, COMPASS trial, which I already outlined. And we're waiting, we await the Voyager PAD trial. The other trials have not really shown efficacy. So in summary, uh, this, the mechanism of PAD progression and genesis of cardiovascular events involves thrombotic and platelets interacting pathways. The balanced use of DOAX is specifically rivaroxaban uh, by all the trials that I've already shown you. And single platelet inhibition achieves a marked reduction in cardiovascular events. 
while not imposing significant bleeding risk. The strategy is also cost effective and dedicated studies like Voyager and the post revascularization patients are pending. Thanks very much. Great, Bill. I really appreciate this. Um, you know, I challenge them to try to put it all together in a short amount of time. I think you're doing a fantastic job of really laying down the groundwork so we can then have our discussion. And we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Almeida, who they will discuss how he manages patients to prevent uh, venous thrombosis. Thanks, Tino. Good morning. So I'm going to talk about the venous and uh, We'll start with the title, um, Prevention of uh, Venous Thrombobolic Events, and then just kind of roll it into the uh, Factor 10 uh, concepts. So as you've seen already, uh, you know, the chest guidelines are major guidelines have been for years, and what I wanted to show here is how Factor 10 inhibition, or DOACs, are now falling into standard of care for antithrombotic therapy and venous disease. So for overall, a venous thromboembolic risk reduction, DOAX at least equal vitamin K antagonist. As you heard earlier, it's much more easier to administer uh, a DOAC than a vitamin K. Uh, as far as cancer, it has been low molecular weight heparin over vitamin K inhibition. You'll see, and you've heard earlier, that uh, DOAX are uh, moving into this realm also and probably will replace uh, low molecular weight heparin for cancer patients also. As far as risk of bleeding, DOAX are better than vitamin K inhibition, and apixaban is probably the best of these. And GI bleeding, still vitamin K antagonism better than the others, uh, the, the factor two or 10 inhibitors, uh, and we'll see how this plays out. So as far as prevention or, or thromboprophylaxis for procedures, uh, Joe Caprini's worked on this his entire career, and I like his, uh, his score, uh, it's validated. Uh, and it's all the, the same general concept of, uh, uh, you know, assessing risk uh, prior. So you can assess one, two, or three points and add them up and you get a risk and that's how you're going to guide your prophylactic measures. And I just point out these because uh, they're going to come in on a slide earlier, but, you know, age is a major one, one point for lower age and the points increase as age increases. And things like minor surgery would be one point. Uh, but the ones with three points are, are older age, history of venous thrombobolic events, and all of the thrombophilia type factors. So for example, you go in uh, for a staph and sublation, this would be a minor surgery, all of these, so one point. Leg swelling, amazing, is only one point. Again, history of venous thrombobolic events will give you three points as well as family history. So that's the highest scores. Uh, age, as we uh, saw, the higher the age, the higher the point. Obesity, surprisingly, is only one point. History of cancer, two points. But it all falls into this. So you've got your point scheme. You're going to have a low, moderate, or high risk, and that's how you're going to judge your prophylaxis. So the more risk, the more uh, prophylaxis. So compression, compression plus pharmacotherapy, or compression pharmacotherapy and uh, more strict surveillance. So uh, somebody's already on anticoagulation and about to have a procedure, do you stop it, do you bridge it? Uh, and this is a complicated question uh, with all these factors or variables involved, uh, you know, the, the risk that we just heard, the type of surgery, the, uh, which anticoagulant, uh, how well it's absorbed. The interesting part as it relates to venous disease, uh, so I've been pretty much 20 years only venous and, and quit arterial. And, uh, I started with my venous procedures respecting the dogma of, of, of surgery and anticoagulation, stopping the anticoagulation for three, four days, bridging, and now uh, if they're anticoagulated, it doesn't matter if it's uh, vitamin K or DOAC, they go right in the operating room, fully anticoagulated, even for phlebectomy, for major recanalizations, for vena cave uh, extractions. I just have gotten to the comfort level where I prefer them to be anticoagulated. Uh, I, the risk of thrombosis is higher than the risk of bleeding in, uh, in these venous cases. You can apply pressure to the leg, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as far as provoked and unprovoked DVT treatment, we have already heard that three months is kind of the benchmark, probably on the strength of the Prandoni data. Uh, if no cancer, again, DOACs are replacing standard vitamin K therapy as the treatment of choice. And in cancer, still, according to the last chest guidelines, low molecular weight heparin, but uh, I'll show in another slide. Um, as far as the duration of anticoagulation, again, it's a three-month benchmark. 
and then you start individualizing. Is it proximal? Uh, is it distal calf pain thrombosis? Uh, is it a secondary episode? Uh, what are the bleeding risks? So you work from the three months, but you may want to extend anticoagulation based on other factors of risk uh, as you individualize patients. So, and many of them just fall into lifelong anticoagulation if they've got the two or three thrombophilic markers and recurrent thrombosis. Uh, here's the cancer slide. So as far as recurrent uh, thromboembolism, DOACs are now better than lumicoid heparin, at least in this meta-analysis for cancer patients, but still with bleeding, uh, DOACs fared worse than lumicoid heparin in this uh, meta-analysis. As far as uh, stents, which is a common question now, how to manage stents, there isn't much. It's mostly anecdotal, mostly conversation, mostly what you learn at meetings. But this one study uh, looked at uh, patients with stents in the acute DVT group, in the post-thrombotic group, and the May Thurner non-thrombotic group. And the take-home message was that occlusions, if they occur, they occur early, and the, and the diameter, the stent size, is the most uh, uh, is the most important variable for uh, stent thrombosis. I like this little uh, uh, write-up by Stephen Black in Endovascular Today. This is really the way I look at it, and I think it's true. The technical piece of the procedure, uh, this is regarding stent patency. Uh, so there's the technical part, did you place the stent correctly? The hematologic is very important. Uh, is it going to be platelet only? Is it going to be DOAC? Is it going to be anoxaparin? Uh, and then the most important thing down here is the inflow. And the inflow is such an important part of the game. If you've got poor inflow, you're going to need uh, lifelong anticoagulation to maintain st stent patency. As far as his uh, experience in the UK, risk of thrombosis higher in the first weeks, that's probably true. They like two weeks of low liquid heparin and then uh, uh, Coumadin for a while before they'll bridge them. In my experience, uh, I mean, I'd love to give them three months of low microwave heparin, but they, they just can't stab their abdomen that long and then the bruising. So if they can give us four weeks of low microwave heparin, then I'd like to switch them to a pixaban. These are people with post-thrombotic stents with extensive recanalization. You've been in there with a balloon beating up the endothelium, trying to stretch things open. Uh, we've all seen going straight to a DOAC after these cases a lot of failure. So uh, we're all kind of moving into this more uh, anoxaparin type perioperative before we, we switch over to a DOAC. And, and this is just conversation, what we're hearing. So Mark Meisner, one of our wizards in the venous space, working with his hematologist, uh, uh, you know, asked this question, why are these extensive recanalizations going down with DOAC inhibition? And, and the hematology people at the University of Washington seem to think it's related to factor 11. So that's part of the reason why a low molecular weight heparin early on to get the entire cascade uh, and then maybe switch it over to a factor 10. Uh, so that's really the rationale, uh, at least anecdotally, for, for this. In conclusion, um, DOACs continue, the role of DOACs continue to expand, including cancer patients. Uh, renal insufficiency of Pixaban uh, is being used. Uh, I didn't hear that from the speakers, but the Pixaban is being used more for uh, renal failure. Perioperative management, you know, they're already on a DOAC, you're going to the operating room or interventional suite. How do you manage their existing uh, uh, anticoagulation status and if they're on something, whether they're bridge, that's very individualized. It depends on the, on the risk and the type of procedure. Uh, bridging in general is not needed. I don't bridge and I don't even stop it uh, for venous disease, not, uh, not uh, arterial. And the jury is still out on complex recanalizations of, of venous stents, how to go about uh, anticoagulating them. Thanks. Great, Jose, thank you very much. Um, we'll go now and try to do some clinical cases. I don't know if there's any questions. If you have any questions, you can kind of raise your hand. We're gonna to try to interact and get through some uh, clinical situations. You've really heard a lot now in terms of the management of arterial and venous disease. And the way I kind of frame this is really preventing thrombosis. We discussed a little bit about the significance and the guidelines. <clears throat> and I think it's interesting that you heard the significance. You're not really looking at, we know it's a prevalent problem but the cost of that problem in terms of the risk to the patient, mortality, morbidity, and the economics of treating these patients and trying to prevent it from occurring seems to be a, a big issue. So I'm gonna start with the first case. So DJ is a 45-year-old female with a history of unprovoked right lower extremity DVT. 
Patient had right lower extremity swelling, went to see her PCP, an ultrasound confirmed right femoral vein DVT. She was started on uh, river Vacrovan, 15 milligrams BID. At one week, her symptoms improved. She was then switched to 20 milligrams QD after three weeks, day 21. The patient is seen at one month and then at three months, there are no bleeding concerns. The patient at the three month visit wants to stop her anticoagulation. What do you do and what are your discussions with that patient? Tony, you wanna to start with that? Uh, sure. Um, I'm going to make a, a, a tiny, tiny provocative statement. That's, what, that's why we're here. The CHEST guidelines do not recommend three months of anticoagulation for DVT. Now that I've got your attention, they recommend at least three months, at least. And many physicians, clinicians around the world have latched on to that three month time period. I believe it is inadequate for most patients, especially patients at high risk, unprovoked, large burden thrombosis. And the, the other fact when you look at anticoagulants for acute deep venous thrombosis is whether you treat for six months or one year or two years or more, when you stop anticoagulation, the rate of recurrence remains the same, whether you treat for six months or two years. So you're looking at that high rate of recurrence, especially in high-risk patients. Now, the other, the other important observation with anticoagulants is if patients are going to bleed, they tend to bleed early. Most bleeds occur within the first month, the overwhelming majority within the first three months. So if a patient takes an anticoagulant for a month, two months, three months, and there's no bleeding, the relative risk of bleeding is way down in that patient moving forward. So they've self-identified themselves as safe. So to answer your question, Tino, I would, I would strongly recommend to the patient to continue anticoagulation. I think that once a decision is made that, okay, you've, you've had an adequate therapeutic course, I would try to convince her to go on low-dose low extended therapy, especially if it was an unprovoked uh, venous thrombosis. So uh, I think Tony, that's how, long, how long would you want to keep her on that low dose? I, I follow your logic and I understand. Well, how long would you keep her on the low dose? Basically, as long as, as, long as uh, she would take it. By, by low dose, 10 milligrams? Yeah, uh, rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams, or pixaban, 2.5 BID. Great. So I think that was a great answer, and I liked how you explained that, Tony. Really going over the risk profile, the bleeding profile, and the fact that a lot of these bleeds occur early. I think that's something we can tell the patient, right? And then, I, you know, I think it's very common. Patients latch on to this three to six months, and they come in at three months saying, okay, I'm ready to stop. And I think having that discussion, especially like the data you presented of the, the importance of preventing that that, you know, that secondary prevention, I think, is important. Raghu, do you have anything to add there? How, yeah, what, else would, uh, what else do you say, or do you say something different? I wouldn't say something different, but the uh, issue in, and what uh, Tony said that we have to remember is what does the patient want to do as well at this point? Uh, Tony said try to convince the patient, so that is the discussion you need to have. I just saw a patient on, uh, m uh, on Monday, uh, and on Tuesday, who refused to see, refused to be on any anticoagulation. Uh, I, I was seeing um, the PE, which was submassive with a PA pressure of 70. Uh, one year, uh, one and a half years ago, his primary care stopped his anticoagulation because he didn't want to be, and he had 10 CT scans within the last year, but he absolutely, again, refused to be on any anticoagulation, even though I told him that you know, this is similar to aspirin, the bleeding risk, or similar to, and he did not have any issues with coverage either. He just plain did not want to take it. So you just document that, and it's a shared decision-making. I think that's probably because of TV commercials. 
Yeah. In, in this particular one, um, so you, you put femoral DVT. So to me, femoral DVT, is it femoral DVT or is it femoral DVT? Um, and if it's a, you know, a small popliteal femoral and it re this is the other thing that, that using ultrasound to guide therapy is not, there's no data behind it. The, the data is very difficult to gather on, you know, what amount of compression and recanalization, how it correlates to recurrence. So uh, for, for the time being, and I think you'd agree, Tony, uh, duplex really has no role in, but I use it. Um, so we do duplex them and uh, see how much recanalization is going on, symptom relief, and, and I try somebody like this to stop at three months and, uh, you know, and go on baby aspirin and just tell them about the recurrence risk. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. I, I like to do the ultrasound if, if I see that the symptoms aren't getting better. If they get better with the symptoms, then I, I'm less likely to get it. But I think you're right. That may help your decision, right, and whether there's more. Okay, Tony? So uh, I don't agree with that. And when you look at the, what's the problem with patients with unprovoked deep venous thrombosis, why do they get DVT? My opinion, and I believe there's uh, some interesting data suggesting that they have an endothelial dysfunction. And that endothelial dysfunction bridges from the venous to the arterial side because those patients have a higher risk of an arterial thrombotic disorder 5, 10, 12 years down the road. And you can measure their endothelial dysfunction on the arterial side of the circulation with um, post-occlusive reactive hyperemia of the brachial artery, and that's been shown. But also, when you look at recurrent deep venous thrombosis, 60% of the recurrences occur in the initially non-involved limb. Not the involved limb, the non-involved limb. If they occur in the involved limb, their post-thrombotic morbidity significantly elevates. So uh, the major problem that these patients have is recurrent thrombosis, not bleeding. Interesting, so more of a systemic process. So I, I agree with Tony, and for those reasons, uh, the Choose Wisely program um, uh, that SBM and AB, ABIM put out uh, recommends, um, you know, against using routine duplex examination unless the patient's clinical symptoms change. Yeah, I think the clinical symptoms, I think, are, are important there. All right, we're going to go to the next patient. RC is referred by cardiologist with claudication, the 60-year-old. PCI to the LAD in the left circ. He's on ram Ramipril for his hypertension. He's on Crestor, and he's on a baby aspirin. He reports 150 mil uh, meter claudication, which significantly affects his ability to work. Non-invasive shows a bilateral FEMPOP disease with an ABI of 0.45. Start him on an exercise program, and you start him on Zolosazol, 100 milligrams BID. Would you consider Rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams BID? Bill, how do you tackle this? Patients that we may yeah, see. Yeah, so I've got to have to unwind some of this to, to talk about it, but that's good. This is a good case. So uh, he's clearly claudicating. He's got a horrible ABI. Um, it's from, it, it's from uh, bilateral firm pop disease. And he's starting an exercise program. We don't know how he's responding to that, and celestisol, which does improve walking distance uh, based on science. The question now is, would we consider rivaroxaban? Rivaroxaban is not going to change his claudication distance. So that's, we should differentiate, we should separate those things early. Really important. Okay. So it doesn't mean that rivaroxaban isn't useful to him. It's just not going to help him in his, in his, what he's presenting with. Rivaroxaban at this dose, not with celestazol, but with aspirin, a low dose, would be useful to him because he's got coronary and peripheral arterial disease, so he's a polyvascular patient. So he's at the higher risk category. And rivaroxaban with low dose aspirin would be useful to him. But I would say at the point you've described him, it's too early to put that in play. I would, I would manage his peripheral arterial symptomatology, see how he does with his exercise program, see if he needs an intervention. Um, post, if he does need intervention or if the celestazol doesn't work, um, I would get him off the celestazol, put him on aspirin, and then, then consider and discuss rivaroxaban with him. I think that's the sequencing that I would use. 
You brought up a very important point in your talk, and you talked about the benefit in terms of stroke, right? And we know our patients with this type of, with PAD, and CAD and PAD, like you called it, you know, Paul, you know, multiple beds are involved here, that, that you know, their, you know, their mortality and morbidity may be related really to coronary disease and to cerebral vascular disease and stroke. Would this, would this affect you if you knew if he had some mild carotid disease, or do you already assume he has some mild carotid disease and do you assess his carotids? And may that sway you knowing this data? Yeah, so um, the data on carotid disease is not that strong uh, out of compass, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna use that as a generator of decision making. Let me just say that up front. I have a personal opinion that I cannot document, but I'm gonna tell you what I think, one of the reasons I think people got better with with, had a, such a dramatic improvement in stroke is because you're looking at a population which is enriched for atrial fibrillation. And I think occult atrial fibrillation is probably being treated here somewhere along the way. I can't document that. I can't, I think, but it's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's just that I think that there's a lot of things going into what the stroke reduction is from. There's probably small vessel disease in the brain. It's probably atrial, occult atrial fibrillation, and it may be large vessel rupture as well. And uh, who knows, aortic disease. I could name all of them, but my point is, um, I wouldn't use an imaging study necessarily to drive my choice of anticoagulation in this patient. Great. Any other points from the panel in this case? So I'm uh, going to very, very respectfully disagree with, with Bill. I think this patient is at very high risk. The, the ABI speaks to that. The fact that he's got documented uh, coronary disease, I'm certain he has cerebrovascular disease that's probably not symptomatic at this point. But this is exactly the type of patient that you give the low dose 10A inhibitor to prevent. And now we have data showing prevention of major adverse limb events as well as MACE. So to wait until an event occurs flies in the face of the data from Compass. So, uh, yeah, Tony, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm not delaying, I'm not delaying his, I'm just saying that I think I need to sequence it as relates to his either intervention or solosazole or something like that, because I don't know what the effect of solosazole and rivaroxaban is together. That was the kicker in this, in this descriptor. I agree with you. I think he's at high risk. I think he should have a discussion about anticoagulation of rivaroxaban and low-dose aspirin. My only, my only hesitation is, we haven't sorted his acute presentation. I think he's at high risk for limb events today, just based on his perfusion. And I think he probably needs an intervention. Um, but I would get all that out of the way, and then I would talk to him about rivaroxaban, because I do agree with you. I think he's at high risk for events. And, and I think I, this also goes to us, at least in my practice, starting now with this type, you know, identifying these patients in our minds, okay, I think this is a high risk. And then the question is when to start, right? when to start and make that transition. And I, I, under, I, I think you're right, you're already making certain changes, right, which are trying to help his claudication with the exercise program, so loss is all, you know it's high risk. When, and I, I think it's a comfort level, and I wouldn't be surprised in two, in two or three years, we'll start it right off the bat, maybe. But I think right now, I think I'm, a, I'm still kind of doing it in a more stepwise fashion, trying to analyze that, and also assessing that bleeding risk, right? Because really, that's what I'm weighing here. To me, it's that bleeding risk. It's very small. But I know I get a lot of improvement in male. I mean, Tony showed some very important data about male rates and how they improve. Yeah, I agree with uh, Bill that at this point, given the use of celestazole, um, adding compass regimen, uh, that it's a triple drug therapy now, and that's where we'll be working in evidence, uh, you know, uh, free zone here. Uh, so uh, I generally don't start uh, compass regimen as long as they are on solistazole. Um, so I, because we don't know the answer to that. After about the fifth call that I got from the pharmacy saying, do you know you're on these three medications? I admit, <laughs> you always get those calls. All right, I think that's a good discussion. Okay, Just Robert? one for my curiousness. Why is uh, the rivaroxaban low dose a BID dosing instead of the usual daily dosing? Half-life. The half-life of the drug? I think that's how the, the trial was, the, at least that's what we have in the data. No, no my, my, so when the, when the trials, when the initial trials, you know, for venous thromboembolism were designed, the, um, and, and there's no difference basically in, in 
in the half-life of rithroxaban versus apixaban. So one company chose to go with the once a day dose at a higher level, another company, the other company went to a, a twice a day dose at a lower level, and then once you make that decision and you start the trial, you can't change it. So I think there's, you know, and it's just supposition of why they chose a twice a day, but, but it, it certainly worked out, and it was the correct decision for the, the ultra low dose PAD group. In the, in the, um in the chart that I showed, I, I kind of glossed over it, but there was a trial that came before this with 10 milligrams per day, but unfortunately it was paired with dual antiplatelet therapy. So in, in, an effort, in an effort to reduce bleeding and, and address that and try to maintain some benefit, I think they went to the dual, the dual dosing and the lower pl platelet regimen. And so we'll never know the answer because we probably won't do another 27,000 person trial. I'm going to run to the third case. We're not going to have much time, so I'm going to run through the case and then have the speakers talk about it. But JR, 55-year-old patient, left leg swelling, demonstrates no DVT. There's narrowing of the left common iliac vein. You discuss stenting. We're going to ask the question, do you start any medication prior to the stenting? At the day of the stenting, you see a venographic evaluation here. This was done really before IVIS, before a lot of the stents we have now, but you can see uh, compression and some collateralization left to right. Patient undergoes successful stenting. What is your post-procedure medication? So that's the second question. There you see the treatment. And now the patient comes back uh, and somehow gets a CT, and they start talking about some little filling defects in the stent. Would that change what you do in follow-up? So three questions. Do you start any medications before these procedures? I'm going to go right to Jose. Do you start any medication before these procedures? After the procedure, do you start any medication? And then if you see a patient later on that may have this, what do you do? I know, loaded question, the I know. The first thing I'd like to, you know, the, for non-thrombotics or a, a true May Therner, uh, even with swelling, the majority, I don't stent. Okay. The majority I follow. I, I don't think we, I'd say one in ten of these patients. Right, so that's the first big message. I think that's yeah. important. So just uh, don't start the, the reflux like it's been done with saphenous ablation, reflux, burn. That, that's the uh, same thing here, uh, swelling, stent, don't do that. Um, I like uh, aspirin, baby aspirin, for non-thrombotics. I reserve uh, more serious anticoagulation for post-thrombotics. Some of this ISR or buildup that we don't really understand, uh, we th and it's usually in the external iliac vein. I see it in the common iliac uh, stent up there too, but we think it's mostly the, the flow phenomenon of uh, the, uh, the caliber changes, uh, trying to maintain luminal caliber that you'll get the buildup along the stent. So for example, if you have a, a large stent in the external iliac coming off of a smaller common femoral vein, you may see buildup in the external iliac just for the body's uh, uh, mechanisms or remodeling mechanisms to, to maintain a, a consistent lumen. There's a law, Lagarf law, that states that in the arterial side, but I, I think that's mostly what it is. So I don't get too excited unless there's symptomatic. Perfect. And then I'll just go in and restretch it with a balloon. Okay. And that aspirin, you continue that? And I, I stick with aspirin in those cases. I really don't get too excited about okay. ISR uh, okay. after seeing this for 10 years. I, I so I, I have a, let, let me ask a question. Let's say this patient had cancer. Patient presents. I, I think we saw great data about patients with cancer here. I think there's a great, I, you know, I think there's great data patient with cancer. And I but, think cancer, you're wearing that risk of, thromb of bleeding versus that risk of, we know that they have that, like yeah, Tony yeah. talked about, I almost said that systemic, that they have a higher chance I mean, so I would probably uh, treat them more. Yeah, you just, so a, a post-intervention patient with cancer, what do you do with that? Yeah, so number one, you just in, introduce a major thrombophilia into the equation. So I, I think they probably would need something more aggressive. And I, you know, the, the problem with low molecular weight heparin, people don't want to stick themselves yep. long term. So, uh, you know, I might use it as a bridge and then go to a DOAC. Yeah. Gonna run out of time here, but I'm gonna go. Oh, oh. Lifelong. Yeah. So, so the question is, what is that? Bring up the lesion inside the stent. What causes stent failure? So basically, it's thrombosis. When uh, in this patient, you could get that answer by doing an arteriogram, putting a biopsy forceps up there, taking a biopsy, and you're going to see thrombus at, at one form, maybe very organized thrombus, or you may see some mesenchymal cells. Well, mesenchymal cells are basically de-differentiated endothelial cells through the TGF beta pathway, and that responds to solostazole. 
So I think the, the pharmacotherapy that will evolve over the next couple years is the importance of ongoing anticoagulation and perhaps the use of, of silostazol in patients with iliofemoral venous stents. With that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the final polling questions. I think I'd like to thank the panel. I think great discussion. I love the discussion about these really what I think practical cases, things that we see every day, how it's changing in our management of these patients. I think we've heard a lot about risk assessment, bleeding assessment, listening to the patient. We've talked a lot about risk factors, especially um, here looking at you know, patients with cancer. So with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and do the post-polling here, the Einstein Choice Trial. Which treatment uh, resulted in